Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, my first time at Baylor. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I thought there'd be about like 200 of us in a room, not need for a mic, and we'd just be chatting about research. Um, this is a big event. It's great. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a project that we've been involved in for, for several years. And in fact, a, a project that started way back. We're going to see if we can get the slides moving. We're just going to use this. Um, back in the, the days of my, my grad school years, um, I, I got very interested in figuring out how robots could interact with humans, how they could have conversations. And as you can imagine, um, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, we didn't quite have the types of models and algorithms that we're dealing with right now. And so this view of dialogue systems was still very fragmented, very much in the same way that the whole field of AI was very fragmented. So when we talked about dialogue systems, essentially our focus in this case was on the bottom right box over here. How do we pick responses? But we would assume that there were other people dealing with the sub-problems of interpreting language, tracking information, and then going from sort of the, the, the selection of the action to some natural language, usually in a very scripted way. There was very little machine learning involved in any of these pieces many years ago. Um, and for, for some time, I moved away from that problem. I essentially thought that um, we just didn't have the tools in terms of the learning to be able to do this adequately. Um, but somehow, the field during that time really exploded. And I, I think there's good reasons for this. Um, if you look, there's on the order of 100,000 chatbots operating on Facebook Messenger, most of them not the work of Facebook. Um, and, this, and so it's a little bit of a wild west out there. Um, there's good reason for this. Uh, we've hit about 1.3 billion users active monthly on Messenger, and this is but one platform. There's several other platforms where people are um, interacting and where natural language or some modern form of natural language is evolving as the mode of communication. In many ways, much of our digital life is currently interfaced with something where a bot could be helpful or could be plugged in. So there's a huge opportunity on the um, business side, but there's also sort of on a scientific side a lot of really interesting challenges that arise and a very rich opportunity for machine learning. So when I returned to this problem a few years ago, we had moved to a point where we could have a much more integrated view of what the dialogue system could be. And we started talking about end-to-end, -end, the so-called end-to-end dialogue systems, where essentially you assumed a single model could, in a unified manner, tackle the problems of interpreting the language tracking the necessary information to then pick the response and then output that response as something apparenting natural language. And so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the models that we've developed on the way to trying to achieve this. I would say the description of the models and algorithms is going to be a pretty small part because a lot of what we've done is try to figure out what are all the other questions around this that we need to address from a technical point of view for this to be a viable proposition in practice. And what I'm going to leave out for today, but are things that we're very actively working on, are sort of the things on the right-hand side. How do we incorporate rich external knowledge, memory, user model, personalization, all of these aspects? Well, I think there's a lot of very fruitful work still to be done, and we're just beginning to explore this in the context of dialogue system. So let me start you with a very simple example to give you a sense of what it is that we're trying to do. Simple chat drawn from one of our dialogue data sets. In this particular, there's a set of Twitter conversations. One agent says, am I out of Twitter jail yet? Testing. And agent number two responds, yeah, I posted bail. And now really what we're trying to do with a dialogue management system, imagine that perhaps you're busy at Baylearn and you can't handle that conversation. You want your avatar to take over and respond in a way that is appropriate for the conversation. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you to just spend one second imagining what response you might produce. Here's what's in our data set. Anyone had that response in mind? <laughs> Nobody from a crowd of very smart people. OK, you're not doing well, right? We're going to train your networks. Um, I, I think the point here is really that, you know, I, I, I'm willing to bet most of your responses were appropriate, um, and yet none of them were this. So in terms of machine learning, there's some challenge here that we don't face in other tasks. If I would asked you instead, showed you a nice picture and asked you, you know, what kind of animal in that picture, I'm pretty sure the agreement rate would have been very, very high. 
And so that means that we have a really clear signal to train our machine. Dialogue system, one of the challenges we have in, in many ways is the fact that we have such a diverse set of signals that are still useful to train the machine. So before I get more into depth in how we're going to try to tackle this problem, let me just do a quick um, sum up in terms of on the technical side how we're building model of this. So I think the best way to think of what we're trying to do here is to model conversations. And so the tool of choice nowadays across the community is really to model this with recurrent neural network architecture. We assume that the input are the word tokens. The word have been coded up as these vectors, sometimes one hot encoding, sometimes with higher dimensional representation. Embedding of word vectors is what you, we use most of the time. And now the network is building up this latent representation of what is going on. And this hidden state representation essentially is designed to capture a summary of the information up to a particular point in time in the conversation. And so our job when we are trying to produce answers is to essentially use this hidden information to generate appropriate responses. This is actually a pretty hard task to do, in particular when conversations get long, when there's a lot of information to try to summarize that or learn how to summarize that with simple techniques like backpropagation. Um, because we thought this was a bit too challenging for us, when we started working in this area a couple years ago, we thought we would simplify the task. And we are very good at a lot of supervised machine learning tasks, so we thought we'd take this task and transform it into a supervised task. In this case, where we would just give the machine a few choices of answers. And so this example is drawn from a data set that we developed. Um, at the time, there was very few open source large data sets. So we developed a data set called the Ubuntu Dialog Corpus. It's available if anyone wants to download it. It has almost a million different dialogues, 100 million different words, so quite large and rich um, compared to other available dialog systems at the time. And so here's the task, right? This is also something that is in a technical domain, so there's at least a notion that it's not just chit-chat, that there might be some task you're trying to accomplish, but we don't have an explicit measurement of what that task is and whether it's completed or not at the end of the dialogue. So the first two sentences are what's known as the context, the previous history of the conversation up to a particular point, and the task for which the machine will be trained is simply to pick one response or a few responses out of a set of candidate response. So in this case, um, the job would be to pick either response number one or response number two. I don't know what you think out there. Response number one? A few brave folks. Response number two? A few of the, a lot of indecisive people out there this morning. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I'll let you figure it out. Go dig in. Your um, Ubuntu knowledge it might be a little rusty, but there's information sources out there. The model we built for handling this kind of question really is what we call a dual encoder model. And so the idea is because we have a context, we can encode that using a recurrent neural network. So this is the part of the graph at the top over here. We're encoding all of the history of the conversation up to that point. And then there's a separate recurrent neural network at the bottom here that's going to encode one at a time the different plausible answers, and then through a trained set of parameters, sort of compare the embedding of the context with the embedding of the response and predict whether that particular candidate response is good or not. And so in this case, if you then train this with a mix of both correct response, where the output should be one, and incorrect response, where the output should be zero, at some point the system should learn to recognize which are correct and incorrect responses. And we can do that using supervised learning. One of the subtleties here is figuring out what is the set of incorrect response with which to train the model. So we typically sample that randomly throughout the corpus, and because the corpus is large enough, that gives us kind of a good basis for training the system for a whole set of incorrect responses. It doesn't rule out that we might sample something as an incorrect response, which is actually a plausible answer to this. So in that sense, we are dealing with somewhat noisy labels. But given the specificity of the task and the size of the corpus, we expect that doesn't happen all too often. So we compare the prediction results of this particular dual encoder model with a simple technique that uses TFIDF, so some word similarity metrics in terms of predicting which response match which question. In this case, I'm showing you the results of that um, and that particular result. And I have different ways to measure the results, right? One in two versus one in 10 means I either provided two candidate answers or 10 different candidate answers to my machine. So as you can imagine, 10 candidate answers is harder than just having two candidate answers. 
And then the R at one means how many of these was the machine allowed to pick as top candidates? So one in 10, recall at one, means it had to pick the one good answer out of 10, whereas in the bottom row down here, the machine was allowed to pick five out of the 10 as being plausible answers, and it got the point if any of these five were correct. So of course, that makes the task easier when the machine is allowed top five guesses rather than just top one. And we see that the, the recurrent neural network, the LSTM approach in this case, is actually learning quite well. And as the task gets easier, it does better, significantly better than a simple TF-IDF model. And we weren't sure how hard that task was, quite frankly, because we, we, we knew that this was a plausible task, but we didn't have a good sense of like, how good are humans at this particular task. Um, so we ran a user study. And because humans are a little bit less flexible than machines, like we have some you know, cognitive capacity constraints. Um, we set the task only looking at five candidate answer, and we asked the humans to pick their first answer and their second answer from this particular set. OK, I'm not going to test you this morning. Um, I see you're still a little sleepy. Um, so um, I'm going to show you the results of what we got for this particular task. It was very interesting. Um, we ran this with several different groups of folks. Um, at the top over here, I'm calling my uh, AMT non-expert and AMT expert. These are people we recruited through Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, it, and frankly, they weren't doing too well. If you look at um, the Ubuntu Corpus R at 1, means out of 5, they had to pick the top answer. They were getting on the order of 52% accuracy um, out of five candidate uh, answers. And, and what was quite interesting is, in this case, they were self-identifying as experts or non-experts, as in, do you know anything about Ubuntu or not? Um, the experts were doing slightly worse than the non-experts. So. Something to remember for those of you designing user study that require any level of expertise, don't trust self-assessment uh, as a metric. Um, if we give them two choices rather than one, they do a little bit better, but frankly, not a lot. Uh, and, and so somewhat disappointed by these results, we turned to some undergrad students in uh, computer science and asked them to be our token lab experts. And in that case, they did clearly much better than the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Good. They're on their way to perhaps a more lucrative job. Um, and when we give them just one choice, they do significantly better than the neural network, the recurrent neural network model. If we give them two choices, they do a little bit better. But the machine can't have catches up with just two choices. And so that was a good sanity check for us in terms of how our models are doing, in that we're clearly learning something more than just the kinds of patterns that humans can assume. This is, we have to remember, very much in a discriminative way. We're not generating these responses with the machine. The machine is only asked to discriminate, in fact, rank which of the answers are better than other answers. Um, so this was a good sort of stepping stone into the next phase where we really started thinking about how can we do natural language response generation? How can we start generating text that approximates the kinds of things we're seeing in our data set? And so in order to do that, we had to build a little bit more complex model to do that. Um, we proposed a hierarchical encoder-decoder architecture. This is very much in line with some of the models that are used for machine translation, where you have one recurrent network that is encoding, so going from the raw text coming in the history of the conversation to some embedding of that conversation space. And then there's a decoder network that goes from that semantic space to the response. In contrast to translation, where in translation you're going to the target language, in dialogue system, you're going to the response space. And because the standard encoder decoder was really missing context, in translation, often this is done on the phrase or sentence level, relatively short sequences. In dialogue, you really need to remember a long sequence of information in some cases to be able to generate the appropriate response. And so we built up some hierarchical model on the encoder side. So we had two levels of encoding, one that updated the model after every word, as in a standard encoder. And then in the second layer, it would update the model at the end of every sentence. So the information from the first level encoder would be passed on to that second level encoder. And I think there's a lot more to be done into figuring out what are the right hierarchical structure to be captured in terms of these kinds of sequence information. People working on RL have done a lot of work in terms of hierarchical RL and so on that we haven't quite leveraged yet in some of these um, dialogue systems. But at least this was sort of a first attempt at leveraging some of those sort of multi-time resolution information in the context of a dialogue. 
So we train this as a standard encoder, decoder architecture, um, and we now have a way to sort of produce responses in natural language. We performed a pretty thorough empirical study of how this worked. In this case, we're not going to go through all the fine details of that. A lot of that is in the paper for those who are interested. And I think the salient point is just to compare how does a simple n-gram language model would do versus a standard recurrent network language model versus our hierarchical encoder, decoder. In this case, we're doing bidirectional training. And we also have some pre-training that helps a lot. And so we're measuring that in terms of the perplexity. In this case, smaller means better performance. It's essentially a measure of how well we're predicting the sentence compared to what's in the data set. And so in terms of take home from this, right, we do find that the neural models are significantly better than the ingram models. That's not quite unexpected. We have sort of a number of years of result of natural language, the last 10 years or so, that have been pushing in that direction. We found that the hierarchical structure was able to handle the information tracking, at least generate higher quality response compared to the simple RNN. Pre-training both of our embeddings and of our sequence encoder seemed to help a lot. Um, but still, in many ways, the response that the system was generating were very safe and generic and really didn't seem to go to the full sort of interesting results that could be obtained in terms of variety. And so from that point on, we started investigating other models, in particular on the generation side. So as much as we'd focused previously in figuring out how we could have more structure and handle longer sequences on the encoder side, um, we hadn't paid as much attention on the generation side. So we started playing with some of these latent variable models where you inject latent variables on the decoder side, and these variables are actually a mechanism to modulate the type of information that is generated. And we played both with sort of discrete and continuous variants of these variables. And depending on what type of information you're trying to generate, very factual or more chit-chatty, different kinds of variables seem to have different um, characteristics. We have good methods to train these kinds of models. And so I'm not going to, you know, we, we have more results on, on this, but I think at this point, we had sort of a collection of models, and we'd had sort of the academic paper trail and the empirical results and the anecdotal results to sort of support that we were producing interesting things. Um, but, but the time came to sort of confront our uh, models to a slightly bigger challenge. And so um, pushed forward by a group of uh, a very um, keen students, um, a team decided to enter the, the Amazon Alexa Prize. And, and tried to test how these models that we had been developing would do in practice. Um, and so for those of you who might not be familiar, I expect most people are, the goal was really to deploy a model that could have conversations with people, and, and it was going to be deployed on these uh, Amazon devices in people's home, and the system was really measured in terms of its performance, in terms of its level of engagement with people, how long they were engaged, how many times, and so on. Um, and our challenge was really the fact that we had a huge set of these different models, and we didn't quite know which one to deploy. And to make matters a little bit more complicated, um, the rules of the challenge were such that initially, like the system we first had to deploy, we weren't given any data. So we had to somehow kind of you know, ship a system blind without having seen specific data from that distribution. Um, so we had to use a model that had trained on some other data that we had to get somewhere. Um, so we had this collection of models, and we didn't know how to, how to pick which one to deploy. And so um, we started thinking about how we were going to do that. Once the system was deployed, we were going to get some data from the interaction with the users that we were able to use to update the parameters. But as you can imagine, for these families of model, the amount of data that you need to train them is really quite large, and so we're getting most success with training with hundreds of thousands of conversations, and we weren't going to get that volume of data. And so we developed an approach that is the combination of uh, unsupervised learning as well as reinforcement learning. And the idea here is really to take our collection of models that we have trained from all these previous studies. We have some simple recurrent neural network model. We have some HRED hierarchical model. We have some latent variable versions of it. Each of these can be trained with several data sets. I talked about the Ubuntu data set, about the Twitter data set. There's also a Reddit data set. There's some movie dialogue corpuses and so on. So take our different models, pre-train them in an unsupervised manner with the different data sets that are currently used in the community. That gives us a collection of models. 
and now assume that we have a policy whose role is just to pick which model responds to use at what time. And so we were going to use whatever little data that we could get from the users to just adapt that selection policy, but not to try to train the underlying models. And that proves to be a pretty robust approach right now, given sort of where we are in terms of state of the art of training large models and being able to deploy in situations where you don't have that much training data for the particular deployment situation. The, re the RL model re that we used was relatively simple. It was essentially a parameterized policy where we just looked at particular features of the conversation so far of the model, and we used that to score the different models based on a reward that matched the conditions of the competition, so based on user engagement, length of conversations, and so on. Um, just doing that raw approach doesn't quite cut it in these kinds of competitions. So we had a few rules that sort of linked all these pieces together. You know, first you would get all of your response model together. They would each generate a set of candidate response based on the dialogue history. So the choice of response was always conditioned on the dialogue history. We would see if there's any of these response that was sort of earmarked as a high priority response in terms of uh, types of things we would use for sort of opening and closing conversations, the kind of things that you can script reasonably well, and in which case you should script these things and not necessarily try to learn them. Um, then we would evaluate the candidate response. So on the right-hand side is where you start using the reinforcement learning model. On the left-hand side, you're using the unsupervised model. So you evaluate your candidate response and you return the one that seems to maximize your um, reward according to your current policy. So it's a relatively simple framework. The nice thing is you can sort of sub in models as you get new models into there. You can actually use prior information in terms of scoring the different models if you have it, and you can actually track over time how well you're doing. Um, we used a similar approach in a second competition. Uh, there was a NIPS conversational challenge uh, run a year ago, um, and we developed a second RL chatbot to do that. The objective of that were a little bit different. The idea here was that the chatbot had to be able to take in a news item, a little short article, and be able to engage a user in a conversation about that particular article. So we used a similar architecture. In this case, because the application was a bit different, what was interesting is we could plug in slightly different models. We had a set of retrieval models that sort of retrieve useful information and facts and transfer that into responses for the user. We still had our basic generative model, and we had a few more rule-based models that we sort of piped into the set. And again, assume that you have that collection of pre-trained models, assume you have a reinforcement learning policy on top that you're training. And once again, we were able to have a little bit of user data, but not a whole lot. So nowhere near what we would need to train the whole collection of models, but sufficiently to tell us or to teach the AI system how to pick between the candidate responses. And so what I'm going to show you next is a sample dialogue from this RL chatbot from the competition round. Maybe a little bit small to see. Um, it starts, it's an, it's an article that deals with a tragic incident that happened in Iraq, and the bot starts by saying how many people were killed in the capital of Iraq, and the user responds, 11 people, based on the information in the text. And, and then the bot takes an odd turn and asks, what kind of people are you talking about? And the user responds, Iraqi people, poor people, and then the bot inject some random funny fact. Um, and the user acknowledges that this is a funny fact, and then the bot asks, how did you hear about this event? And they go on and so on. And so I, I pull this example not because I'm particularly proud of my bot in this case, um, really because we've had a few of these examples that sort of really gave us some real inspiration about what were some of the new directions and really opening up new problems in this particular case. So I find you, know, you get as much information about seeing how your systems, in this case, how your bots are failing to reply in ways that you would, you know, that, that you would think are appropriate. And so this example, and it wasn't the only one, a few others like that, really prompted us to start looking more in depth at what we could do in terms of the ethical and social aspects of dialogue systems. In many ways, this is very much sort of top of the mind for many researchers in AI and machine learning these days, but it's surprising how not, there's not that much that's been done in sort of a more formal scientific way specifically pertaining to dialogue systems. 
And so I'm going to spend the, the last 15 minutes or so of my talk really highlighting some opportunities more than giving out great answers. These are areas where we started scratching what could be done, and I think there's so much more that we as a community can do in terms of providing robust solutions to these challenges. And so the first one I'll talk about is a problem that's sometimes called value alignment. It's really about figuring out what is the right type of behavior to reward in our system, what kind of loss signal or training signal do we want to provide to our bots so that they develop the kind of behavior that we think are appropriate in the bot in a particular situation, such as not injecting jokes when you're dealing about a tragic event applying to a particularly um, sensitive population. And so talking about value alignment really brings me to thinking carefully about what are the metrics that we are using to train our dialogue systems. And so in some of my previous results, I used perplexity as the measure of performance for our dialogue system. Um, perplexity really looks at the probability of a response compared to what's in the data. Another common one, where it was also in the table earlier, I didn't draw your attention to it, but we have results for this frequently. We use this word error rate, which basically matches the number of correct words with the, the number of words in the utterance. Really simple to, to compute, which is great for this. Um, but on the other hand, not really reflective of we, what we want to, to learn. And, and I take for that just a simple exercise that we went through early on in the talk when I asked you to predict a particular response to my Twitter bot, and in your head, whatever you predicted probably had very small overlap in terms of words with what my bot actually said or what my data set had specified. And so while these metrics you know, are convenient, they're fast, to compute, um, that's great, that's very convenient. Um, they, they, they perhaps don't reinforce the right behavior in our systems. The other metric that's used a lot for generative language models, in particular in translation, is the blue score. And so in machine translation, the blue score has been shown to be really highly correlated with humans' opinion. It essentially measures the number of word overlap in n-grams of different sizes, normalized by the length of the sequence. And so that gives you a good measure, again, based on word overlap. In this case, they've incorporated sort of a brevity penalty to sort of encourage your system not to have like really long sentences that have a lot of words to make sure that you have good overlap. And so we started using this to some of our work on dialogue system with the caveat that it really still was measuring word overlap. But at some point, we got a little bit concerned that this was the right metric. And, and we went back to doing some user studies. After a lot of discussion amongst the, the members of the group, we thought we'd just try it and see what was the correlation between blue scores and human judgment specifically for dialogue systems. I'm not making any comments in, about whether or not this is adequate for other NLP tasks, but specifically for dialogue, generative dialogue systems. And this is what the data showed. On the left, I have the correlation between the blue score and human score. And on the right, I have the correlation between uh, the, essentially the inter-rater agreement, the correlation between human scores. Um, so two humans clearly agree on how to score a particular response. In this case, the, the task was to score the quality of a response on a scale of one to five. Humans agree clearly, but they don't agree with what the blue score is measuring. So if we build systems that are going to maximize this particular score, chances are we're really not sending our learning in the right direction. Um, the good thing about running a user experiment of this type is you collect all these user scores, right? We have this collection to be able to measure this interhuman agreement and human to machine. And so we had all of this data, and so we thought, well, maybe we can learn something from this data. The humans have scored these responses, so let's see what we can do in terms of getting a behavior that is more correlated to the human evaluations. So we built a model that aimed to essentially predict the human score. So not just predict the response, but actually predict the human score. And this is where if I run the exercise between several individuals, we know that they're going to agree, right? They're not all going to predict the same response, but they're all going to agree on what's the score of a good response. And so that makes it really rich information because it means it's a lot less noisy in terms of training our system. So we have the context going into a standard recurrent neural network in this, and we're encoding the context, we're encoding the generated response. In this case, we're also encoding the reference response. So what was the response that was actually said? And we're training that to produce the scores that humans would produce. 
And, and we had a lot of discussion of like, what is it? What score should we use? Should we use like an overall quality score? Should we use, you know, we could ask many different questions of our, of our users. And in most cases, the correlation between different user in terms of agreement was really low, except for this question, how appropriate is the response overall? When we tried to dig in more specifically about dimensions of appropriate, like is this on topic, is this interesting, is this informative, humans would start to disagree. But when we asked them how appropriate is the response overall, then there was strong correlation according to this, and we calculated some of the Kappa scores and so on, and things look good. So we went with just this overall measure of uh, quality, asking them to scale this uh, and training our system pr to predict that score. And what we found in terms of correlation is at the bottom of the graph, we have the prediction of our model, this um, reward prediction machine. In this case, it's doing much better in terms of correlation than the blue scores or some of the other scores that have been used commonly in the literature. Um, and we did a little bit of an ablation study, figuring out what if you take out the embedding of the context or you take out the embedding of the reference response. And it seems to matter to have both of these in to train your scoring model to do better, a little bit better in terms of correlation. Um, so that was reasonably satisfactory. Um, I, I did say that you know, this part of the talk was more about sort of directions rather than fully uh, solved problems. And so uh, I'll perhaps add the caveat that um, this works quite well if you have obtained scores for a particular domain and trained the machine to predict the scores for that particular domain. So if we go back and try to use the scoring machine that was trained, for example, on Ubuntu, and use that to score the quality of response for Twitter conversations, we don't get very good transferability between domains at this stage for the work that we've done. So I think that's still sort of an open question, how to get scoring machines that generalize beyond simple single domains. Um, we, beyond this notion of sort of aligning the reward to the human impression in a supervised way, we also started looking at what other kinds of characteristic were sort of coming out of our systems in ways that we did not intend. And so the notion of bias in machine learning has been discussed quite a bit. In the context of dialogue systems, for many years, bias was really introduced by how the rules were designed. So often the dialogue system were so structured in terms of the set of specific responses, in terms of the type of information that could be inferred, that um, the, the human bias were sort of directly injected into the system. When you now start looking at these end-to-end data-driven dialogue system, the bias is much more introduced through the data, the choice of data sets, and how you've collected these data. And so there's been some work in terms of um, the word embedding themselves, the neural word embeddings, in particular on debiasing these word embeddings at the word level. So trying to sort of neutralize some of the cultural effects that are present in the raw data to get some embedding of words that better reflect some, some values of, um, that we would like to see our systems display. So we looked at whether we could use these debiased word embeddings in the context of dialogue systems. And, and we had quite a bit of fun doing that. Um, and, and this is kind of a simple example where we have uh, pronouns that have a particular gender, but that are sometimes associated with things that are not traditionally associated together, at least statistically in the data. So if we take the last example, for example, you know, she is a footballer, um, is perhaps not the most prevalent association in the data compared to he is a footballer. Um, and, and so in this case, if we use these debiased word vector and ask the system to complete the sentence, um, we get a sentence that says, well, in the standard word to vec, you know, she is a footballer, but we have no ambition of him, and I began to frog my support. So, you know, we can, you know, discuss whether the end of the sentence makes any sense at all. But I think it, one of the salient points is this is a traditional, not the unbiased, but the traditional word to vec. And you see that there's a change of pronoun along the sentence. Because of the word football, or presumably, suddenly the, the pronoun switches to him in the continuation of the sentence. And so we had some hope that the, the debiased word embeddings might help with this. Um, and this is the sentence we got when we switched to these debiased embeddings. She's a footballer, but I was undergoing a drop in the silver possible to Zulu season in second place. So, like there's no reference to him, I guess, that's better, uh, for the sentence. 
Um, but it still seems like you're in a completely different sphere in terms of what you're talking about. And so I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of figuring out how can we be better in terms of debiasing um, the longer sequences and injecting some of that information. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because for many people whose focus might not be to develop a dialogue system, but who might be willing to go for, or be, might be looking for sort of an out-of-the-box solution to sort of fix their problems, um, I think it's important to be very careful about how you use particular situations in the specific context that you're trying to solve. I'm not in any way suggesting that the, the original work on debiasing word embedding was inappropriately done or doesn't you know, meet their claims. What I'm suggesting is I've now taken this method and applied it to a different context, and it doesn't do what I'm looking for at all. Um, and it wasn't just about debiasing. We also looked at uh, removing hate and offensive language. This was particularly important uh, for deploying the Alexa bot. In this case, it was going to go in people's homes. Some people um, do not like to have a device uh, say offensive words to them, particularly if they have children in the house, probably. Um, and so we tried to see how could we remove some of this language. And we started by just looking at the prevalence in the data set. So if you look at some of the four most common data set that we use in a lot of our experiments as well in, as in other research group, um, between Twitter, Reddit, the Movi dialogue, and Ubuntu, which one do you think has the cleanest language? Ubuntu by far. Stay away from Reddit. <laughs> the problem is that you know, people with an Alexa, the average person with an Alexa device in their house probably doesn't want to hear about the Ubuntu system while they're having their breakfast. So we need to start looking at what we can do in our system to do that better. And so we looked at what was the prevalence of the offensive or hate speech in the generative language model, right? The first box is really just in the raw data set, but what happens when you start generating the data? And what we saw was quite interesting is it depends how you do the generation whether you're using like a hierarchical or the variational version of it. Um, if you're using beam search rather than stochastic sampling, you're getting a lot less prevalence of these particular words. We still, in this case, needed to apply a filter at the end before we were able to you know, safely go into people's house. But at least it gives some indication about how you might be able to um, have an impact on this in terms of how you're doing the generative model, and it may give you some benefit. Um, moving on from this, we started thinking about like safety guarantees more broadly. What do we need to do in terms of uh, having good um, safety in different kinds of applications? And having a device in people's home is one thing, but more and more people are turning to speech interface in some critical settings where we want um, hands-off uh, access with a voice-controlled interface, whether it's in the medical domain, whether it's in transportation, security monitoring, there's a really large scale of applications. And so we started looking a little bit at adversarial examples in these particular contexts, trying to see what happens when you perturb the input. Do we see large differences in the output? And adversarial examples have been mostly studied in the context of um, images. And there's surprisingly very, very little work on adversarial examples in the context of language, even coming up with a concept of adversarial example, um, I feel is still an open question for this community. There's been some work by Percy Liang, some of his group, on uh, suggesting that we add distracting sentences to paragraph. But if you compare to the classic example here on the right-hand side, you have an image where you've applied some of this random noise onto an image. And to human perception, it still looks very much the same. If I add a distracting sentence to a paragraph, chances are you can easily tell if you pay attention. Um, some people have looked at misspell words. And here also, there's really a notion that if people pay attention, all of these are not really uh, not seeable. So having a good definition, I think, of an adversarial example is going to be a key step in language as we move forward. Um, in this case, we moved to a model where we were just going to sort of inject and remove uh, simple um, characters. And so we, we had an cute example where the, the context of the conversation said, I don't know how many, the, that this is based on the movie Inside Out. I presume some of you have seen this movie. Um, the context, you know, first utterance says, Inside Out is really funny. And then the response is, I could not stop laughing during the first one. I honestly found it to be hilarious. That's a really positive bot. 
And in the adversarial example, we just removed one I out of the word inside. So context still says inside out is really funny. And um, given the number of typos we're seeing in uh, you know, messenger threads, I expect like this is not really adversarial. This is almost mainstream, these kinds of typos. But still, what happens here is the response, same generative model trained on the same data, suddenly shifts and says, I didn't really find it funny. It just surprised me. It seemed like a class of expectations, which could be humorous, but it didn't hit me that way. So the sentiment completely changed because there's one letter that was removed. Now, for this particular case, I think you could argue that you know, what happens when you remove one letter is we don't have a word embedding necessarily for the mistyped version of inside, so it moves to this unknown word token, which is a really generic thing, and maybe you know, the generic thing to do in this particular data set is just to be negative and pan the movie. So still to be determined. But I, I think it really illustrates the fact that these kinds of perturbations, same as we've seen with the case with bias, but also with these kinds of adversarial examples, these things that we see as minor perturbations, the kind of things we really need to be robust to, are completely changing the semantic sense that is coming out of our generative model. So there's really still a lot of work to do, I believe, in terms of developing these dialogue systems in a manner that can encode the kinds of notions that we expect of them. Given the number of bots that are being deployed, I think it's really important to think of how we can do that well and pay really attention to how we can do this in specifically the context of dialogue systems, not necessarily assume that whatever solutions we've developed for other tasks, be it images, but be it even machine learning translation, where the blue score is an adequate metric, transferring that to dialogue system isn't going to be smooth and easy. And we have still a lot of work to do to do that well. I'm going to conclude at this point. Uh, first, I'm going to thank. I'm here with you today. I'm delighted to be here, but there's a team of fantastic students that are in Montreal um, that are asking the hard questions and doing the hard work on a daily basis. So thank you to them, and of course, thank you to you for your attention. Uh, we've got time for a few questions. So there are mics out here. Uh, does anybody have a question for Joel? Well, while people are getting some mics, I mean, I do have a question. I'm interested. Is there somebody there? Okay. I'm back there, but I don't know if they have a mic. Is there a mic? You might need to run to a mic. That requires a, get a mic. commitment to your question. There's a mic right here. Do you want to head over to the mic? Go ahead. Should be on. Can we hear you? Can you hear? Oh, yep. Thank you. They, that was a great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, for the latent variable in your third model, did you find that that was really hard to train? Did the model struggle to encode information in that variable? Yeah, we had some challenge training it. Um, and you know, in many cases, you know, pre-training helped. Figuring out what is the right type of latent variable to match to the particular type of response that, that we wanted to have turned out to be, to be pretty crucial in this particular case. They're not as stable to train as the, the dual encoder model or the simple hierarchical encoder model. Specifically, how you do the initialization of the latent variable and so on seemed to have an effect. Cool. And uh, were you able to take that latent variable and dial it up or down to change the style of output? Um, we didn't do so much dialing up and down. What we did more is look at different types of variables. So looking at discrete variables versus looking at continuous Gaussian distributed variables. What this gave is, in the case of the discrete variables, we were able to inject some more specific information into the sentence. So we have some examples, I believe, where we want to inject specific example about like day of the week or different items of objects, and the discrete variables seem to be doing better for that. Um, but we didn't play so much with. I know some other generative models kind of do the whole scaling and get on the image space. We didn't play with that so much in the in the dialog case. But I think that'd be interesting to try. Very cool. Awesome work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I had a question on uh, how good was it at detecting when the next response, the most appropriate next response is inappropriate, so as to stop the thread. So basically, use this as a filtering for let's say Reddit threads that are getting out of control, so you're detecting that the most res appropriate responses are negative and offensive, and that's actually the time to stop the conversation. 
So how well could we do at do doing that task? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate in a sense. I think it's really related to having the right data to do that And I'm not sure that at this stage we have the right data to be able to to learn that and I I'd, I'd have to think a little bit carefully about how to encode that somehow in my in my reward structure All of these are what we're now calling sort of self-supervised training, right? We don't inject another reward function um, most of, for most of these models. So I'd have to think whether we get that distribution of data. But it'd be interesting to think about it. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. I was wondering, was there, were there other ways to involve human evaluators in the process? And how did you pick this specific one that you talked about? For which part? So we had some human evaluators sort of just to, to compare the different models. Really, with generative models, it's hard to do because, I mean, early on, we wanted to use blue scores and things like that, and it was really very inaccurate. And so the human evaluators were hugely helpful to really help us tell which models are better than others. So we've done a lot more user study that I didn't describe here, where we compare, for example, the performance of the HRED model versus VHRED, right? I'm making a claim that it's generating more interesting, more specific answers, and our user study confirmed that. So I think for anyone working in generative language model right now, it's hard to get away from doing human studies. Um, still, I think that's really the best basis for comparison, and we don't have good automated metric. We tried to do it, and I think for some you know, domain-specific cases, we have a reasonably good metric. But beyond that, still, human judgment seems to be the way to go. Thank you. All right, excellent. We're out of time. Thank you, Joel. It was fantastic. Thank you.